God. Good morning. We are so glad you can worship with us live from where you are. And I'm so grateful that we can worship together. And let's take time to worship our living God. Hallelujah. He is alive. Nothing can take 
your place You are all we need Your love has set us free You are alive You are alive in us Nothing can take your place You are all we need Your love has set us free Whoa. Yes, welcome again to Unison. Um, at this time, we're going to take a moment to do our Minute to Mingle. So online, feel free to reach out to someone else and welcome them to Unison if they're a first-time guest. And we're going to take this moment. Every part. 
part of me. Your peace, your peace cast all my fears away. Your grace gives me the strength I need today. Today, to grace your grace is all sufficient. To grace your grace is sufficient. To grace your grace. Grace is all sufficient, but um, it's for me. To grace your grace, grace is all sufficient. Oh, yeah. To grace your grace, es suficiente. To grace your grace, grace is all sufficient, but um, it's for me. your grace hallelujah glory to God we love you Lord Jesus hallelujah it is your grace that turns things around hallelujah we call on your name because you are our way maker hallelujah hallelujah you are our hope Lord Bring God, come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Calling on the name that changes everything. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. All of my hope. everything. God, 
God turned it around. God turned it around. God turned it around. Calling on the name that changes everything. God turned it around. God turned it around. God turned it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. God turn it around, God turn it around. He is up to something, he is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something, he is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. Right now, He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. Right now, He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. Right now, He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. Right now, He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. Right now, He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something. All of my hope, all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough. God, we know you are turning things around. Yes, God. And you're working all things for our good. We don't see it right now, but God, we know that joy comes in the morning. Yes. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning, Lord God. And you're leading us into victory. Hallelujah. And we press forth and we look ahead of us. Hallelujah. And we see victory. And we're thanking you, God, now for the victory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Yes, God. Every war he wages, he will win. But the God I serve knows only how to triumph. I know how the story ends. Yes, I know how the story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. Yes, I know. I know how the story ends. Yes, I know. I know how the story ends. I'm going to see the victory. I'm going to see the victory for the battle. Belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna, gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see a victory. Gonna see. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see. I'm going to see the victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yeah. 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 I know I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm going to see, I'm going to see the victory. I'm going to see the victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see, I'm going to see the victory. I'm going to see, I'm going to see the victory. For the battle belongs to Lord. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, you take. Hallelujah. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see, I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see, I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, you take. Let's declare it. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you do. You turn it for good. You take, you take, hey. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Let's speak that out right now. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. One more time. You take what 
take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yeah. Cause you're the God that never fails. 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 You are faithful. You are faithful to your promises. You are faithful, Lord. Yes, you are faithful. And you will never fail. You will never fail. No, you will never fail. You will never fail. No, you will never fail. You will never fail. You will never fail. You will never fail. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. We thank you for the victory. Thank you, God. We thank you for the victory. Hallelujah. You're the God that never fails. You're the God that never fails. You're the God that never fails. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So good. Yes. Sometimes we just have to stay right there in his presence. Hallelujah. We worship you. Yeah. Thank you, God. Joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, God. Joy comes in the morning. Whoa. Joy comes in the morning. And we fix our eyes on you. Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning, hallelujah. Joy comes in the morning. I fix my eyes on the victory. I fix my eyes on the victory. I fix my eyes on the victory, yeah. Cause joy comes in the morning, yeah, yeah. Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning, yeah, yeah. Joy comes in the morning, yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. your presence in this place. We thank you, God, for the victory, Lord. Yes, God. We don't back down because we know who wins, God. Amen. So we will fight for you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We will push through. And what the enemy meant for destruction in our lives, in our community, Hallelujah. in our nation, in our world, you will use and turn for your good yes, and your glory, God. Jesus. Oh we Thank trust you, God. you yeah. Lord God. We trust you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for your presence that's so wonderfully here. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love it's you, all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you.
worship you. So right now, you may be we just in your living room and Jesus. you're not sure what you're feeling, but Jesus. just pray that you would be obedient. Just worship him we where you are. It's not about the bricks and building around the church. We're the church. We worship you, God, wherever we are in spirit and in truth, Father. Maybe you're all by yourself, but go ahead and just worship him. Open up your mouth and give him praise. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your word. Your word.
Nobody like you, God. Nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. God, we honor you. We glorify you. We lift you up. We adore you, King of Kings. Be glorified, God. Be magnified, King of Kings. It's in your name, God, we lift you up. It's in your name that we worship you. And it's also in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you kids and youth of all ages, if you have an extra device handy, go ahead and hop on that Zoom link. It's posted on Facebook. It's going to be the same link every or same link every week. So we will join you down there in a second. Yes. Hey, 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 hey. I was just on it with the mic. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. I promise we'll move. Joy comes in the morning. Oh, joy comes in the morning. Oh, 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 oh. we believe the but joy comes in the morning. For a night, joy comes in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joy comes in the morning. I smile now because. Joy comes in the morning. I leap now because joy comes in the morning. I praise you because joy comes in the morning. I lift you up because joy comes in the morning. I spin around now, God, because joy comes in the morning. Hey, hey, hey. Joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Joy comes in the morning. Huh, that's in my soul this morning. Joy comes in the morning. Thank you, Lord. Oh, joy comes in the... Pull it back a little bit. I promise we are going to move forward. But the moment Lily started singing that, I felt that in my soul that somebody just needed to be reminded of that over and over again. The joy comes in the morning. You're in the middle of your midnight right now, oh, but oh, joy comes in the morning. You're feeling low right now. You feel depressed right now, but joy, joy comes in the morning. Yes, it does. 
And you might just need to remind yourself of that this week. The joy comes in the morning. We are collectively in the middle of a long night. The word says that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Lord, we look forward to the victory that you, well, we will have in you, but also, Lord, we look forward to the break of sunrise. God, and some of us can already feel it, and some of us are still in the lowest valley. Some of us are still in the pit. And so we lift each other up. We lift each other up. Sister, brother, remember that joy comes in the morning and we're never alone. Oh, even though I can't see, I know you're with me, God. Joy comes in the morning. We adore you, King of Kings. All right, we got to move. We got to move. So, <laughs> hey, it is such a privilege to be able to be together. Um, I was, as I was kind of pacing in the back of this mostly empty room, <laughs> I'm like, man, you would never think like it's gonna fall this deep in an empty room. <laughs> but uh, scripture says we're two or more gathered in his name. He is there in our midst. And so there's at least 10 of us in this room. No, <laughs> There's 10 of us in here. And so uh, it is a privilege to be together. How are we doing on sound? because is, is it sounding okay back there are we good it's a little low um they're saying it's a little low i don't know um it could be because i am not are, am i not using the microphone this mic right now is that one off okay so i'm going to take this one off turn um turn up my earbuds and then we'll be good um and so i'll go ahead and a little bit and then um, I know it's a little bit of a delay, and so y'all let us know if it's all right in terms of the sound. Um, we are, uh, oh, real quick, um, some of, so many folks have, con what's that? Many of us have uh, continued to give online and that kind of stuff in terms of offering um, and tithe and um, praise God for that. Um, wait, for thank y'all, chocolate jalapenos. <laughs> y'all was, I mean, y'all was kicking it today. Um, and so uh, you've continued to give online, and that is a blessing. Um, and um, honestly, it is a joy to be able to see um, what God is even doing in terms of finances in unison, and how we are then now being able to creatively, one, invest into um, leadership here, but also be a blessing to our community. So we've got we're in, already in the process of planning to do some things and some ways to kind of be engaged. Um, we just recently found out um, that recent stats as it relates to COVID-19 that the 49507 zip code um, has the greatest n amount of cases in all of Grand Rapids, which is, should not be a surprise to us um, if you've been following along with any of the stats around the country urban areas um, you know, uh, have been hit the hardest. Um, and as um, the 49507 zip code is densely populated, also densely populated with minorities, if this is what it is, this is that part of the city. Um, and so we wanna continually, one, be wise in how we can be engaged with the neighborhood, but also seeking, Lord, seeking the Lord about how we can creatively be engaged in relief that way. So be praying for that, but know that some things are coming up where we can be uh, together with that. Um, we are in week two of a sermon series. If you missed last week's sermon, I want to tell you to go find it somewhere. Sadly, it cannot be found. <laughs> um, we have been trying to get in touch with Facebook. Like shortly after we finished last week's service, um, it was gone. Um, it just disappeared. And so we're still in the process of working with Facebook to try to figure out where that is. Um, and so the moment, though, that we have either the video or an audio, we'll make sure that that gets out. Um, and this week, we're on week two of this sermon series. Um, it's called You Asked For It, because in the summer, we do a sermon series that the ideas come from the congregation. And so um, there's still time to be engaged with that. Shoot an email, put a, um, put a comment on this um, live feed. 
um, shoot a text or, you know, even a, a Facebook message, and that would be cool. Um, just ideas for a sermon, right? What is it that you always wanted to have a sermon? Um, excuse me, what is something you've always wanted to hear a sermon about? Uh, and so um, we are week two of that. It's called You Asked For It Season 3. And um, that's because this is the third time we've done it. And today we're talking about something that's a really important topic. topic. Um, and in truth, um, it's in no way disconnected to what's going on in our world. Like it's not disconnected. It's the topic is different, but it's not disconnected uh, from what we're experiencing in terms of COVID-19. It's not disconnected from that. Um, it's not disconnected from racial reconciliation, not at all. And so one of the things that I feel like is important for us is to not that we drag out what's going on in the world as we navigate the word of God, but that we are intent about making sure that we're applying the word of God to what's going on in our world, right? And so today, um, uh, Jesse and Yadi down in Nicaragua, they sent a, um, a sermons idea and it's, can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? Um, it's like, it's a, it's a simple question. Um, and for some of us, like, this is like, yeah, so this is review, right? For some of us, like, this, this is like review. And some of us have honestly wrestled with this question. Some of us come from either, we have not been churched before. Many of you are maybe joining for the first time. What's up? Um, and some folks may have also been a part of uh, theological traditions that don't really talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it's a really good question. It's a valid one for us to process. Um, and so we're going to be actually in a few different places in Scripture to get to the root of this. Um, generally speaking, we don't jump around as much. We try to take one large section, and I promise you there is definitely one large section <laughs> of Scripture that we'll talk about. Um, but we're going to jump around because I think there's some foundational thoughts that we have to have before we get into it. Stop. Let's pray, let's pray and then we'll dive into the word. Father, we thank you for your word. It is your revealed heart for us. It is your values. It is your character. It is your uh, desire and will for the human um, race and as it relates to our relationship with you and our relationship with one another. And Lord, may our hearts be surrendered and our minds attuned to where you are. May our ears be open and may our souls be ready to receive what it is that you have, Lord. Anything that we come to this conversation, um, to this time in your word, any way we come where it's not surrendered, Lord, we cast that to the side now and say, Lord, we surrender. Uh, may our hearts be both convicted and encouraged, and may our lives be transformed by this time in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I think foundationally we have to talk a little bit about what it means when we actually see the word spirit in scripture, right? So holy, we understand that is either separated and, and set apart for God or an attribute of God. So this attribute of God in terms of spirit well, when we see spirit in scripture, it doesn't matter whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, it generally means one of two things, breath and or essence, right? So when you think about, like, you took my breath away, right? <laughs> That's a part of this idea of spirit. Even when God breathed into Adam, like, it's that same concept. It is breathing, not just air, right? Because he didn't breathe into donkeys. <laughs> That's not because it wasn't just about oxygen. He wasn't like, you know, he wasn't doing what the CPR with him, right? It was breathing in his essence. Who God is was breathed into Adam. Now, that's one way in which scripture speaks to the idea of spirit. But another is the power of God. Anytime, like anytime we see that the idea of the spirit of God fell on someone, it's really talking about the power of God. And that is also a part of the essence of God. Right. That's a, like when we see in the beginning, when God spoke there, his power was on full display when he said, let there be light, let there be a firmament, let there be this and let there be that. And so when we talk about spirit, we're talking about the essence or the power of God in the Old Testament. For the most part, the Holy Spirit fell upon individuals or they were filled with the spirit for particular moments. 
And only a few times do we see that the Holy Spirit kind of hangs out with somebody. Uh, and so I'm going to, um, for a prolonged period of time, I'm going to read a couple of portions of scriptures just as an examples. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 5 through 6, we see um, this about King Saul. Uh, Samuel had just, so the prophet Samuel had just anointed Saul, and he gave him some, him some instructions. He says, when you arrive at Gibeah of God, where the garrison of the Philistines is located, you will be, you see me, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the place of worship. They will be playing a harp, a tambourine, a flute, and a lyre, and basically the chocolate jalapenos. No. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, we call our band here the chocolate jalapenos. They'll be playing a harp, a tambourine, a flute, and a lyre, and they will be prophesying. At that time, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. That's one example of that idea of the Spirit of the Lord falling upon someone. Here's something else, too. Also in Samuel, this is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Um, this is after Samuel anoints David king. He says, so as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Like, I, that, is, that is that experience, that example, rather, of that prolonged period. David is a unique character in the Old Testament, not because he was a great warrior, not because he was the dope poet, but because the Spirit of God hung out with David. In many, many situations, we just see that it's not even, he's not separate. It's very similar to like Elijah. Elijah, very powerful prophet in the Old Testament. And the Spirit of God was just with Elijah, with David. Um, one of my favorite judges to not be my favorite because he was full of drama <laughs> was Samson. Um, he's in Judges chapter 15, verse 14. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph, but the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as they were, excuse me, as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrist. Right? I'm giving you all of these examples because that idea of the Spirit of the Lord falling upon someone, really in the Old Testament, we see that it's predominantly in moments. Right, The Spirit of the Lord gave somebody the ability to do something. Generally speaking, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord fell on folks for a moment. And we can describe that as being filled with the supernatural power of God to speak or act on the behalf of God. That's important. Why, do, why are we talking about the Old Testament? Because many of us want to throw away the Old Testament when we get to the New Testament. But that's not how this relationship with God works. And... It's not how the Bible works. That is foundational understanding about the Spirit of God. That's foundation. And everything in the New Testament is built upon that. It doesn't get thrown away when we get into the New Testament. The Spirit of God falls upon people in moments in the Old Testament to either speak on behalf or act on behalf of God, and it is a display of his power. And so when we start talking about the New Testament, there is this buildup on it. This is what Jesus says is in uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 15 through 16. Um, uh, this is, it says, everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon. Sorry, this is John speaking. Uh, everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their question by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Pause. The practice of baptism, um, we see that right now as kind of an outward expression of what God's doing on the inside. But even for Jews, especially in these first century Jews, the practice of baptism was a part of their repentance, but also a renewing of the covenant with God and preparation for the Messiah. And so that's where we begin to see, that's really one of the first times we begin to see this idea of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It go, uh, we see in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, 
Once when he was sitting with them, this is Jesus, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Hopefully you're starting to see a pattern that nothing has changed in terms of our understanding of what the Spirit of God does in and through humanity is still what the Old Testament is talking about, that we are empowered supernaturally to speak and or act on the behalf of God. But there's a portion of Scripture that is in the New Testament that actually points to the Old Testament that really gives us an understanding of how it is that we are supposed to function right now. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Pausing just for a second because we're going to finish this. But I need us to catch that this idea of pouring out of God's spirit is for this is for something, right? That we said before, in prophecy, some of us have in our minds that prophecy means predicting the future, and that isn't what we're talking about. That's, that is a part of prophecy. It's a section of prophecy. It's like just as much as when I'm talking to, when, if you're talking about my voice, well, I don't, I flirt with my wife, but I don't flirt with everybody, <laughs> right? Not all prophecy, not every time God is talking is he speaking about the future. Sometimes he's even talking about the past, but he's revealing something to, to humanity that only he sees, right? That's really what we need to think about when we think of prophecy. And, he, and it continues here. This is Peter talking. He says, and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn, be, turn blood red before the, that great and glorious day of the Lord's arrival. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm pausing again. This idea of being baptized with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit, we cannot remove the, the idea of the, that foundational thought that the Holy Spirit comes upon people to speak powerfully and act powerfully on the behalf of God. That's actually what this portion of Scripture is pointing to when it's talking to the idea of there being fires and the sun being turned to dark and the blood Excuse me, the moon being blood red as these signs, these wonders, all about the, this idea of the Holy Spirit being poured out on all people. But that last portion is an incredibly important part of the scripture. But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a, this is a bit of a hint in a, a, as to how it is that we're supposed to be functioning. Prophesying and, and signs and wonders isn't just to display the power of God. God's never been into talent shows, right? That's just never been his thing. Where it's like, I'm going to just show everybody what I can do. It's never, not even in the Old Testament, even in those big displays of power. Like I think about Mount Carmel, where Elijah is like calling down fire from heaven and everybody is like, oh, it's God, right? That's not a talent show. There was something happening on the other side of those signs and wonders, and it had to do with people believing. It had to do with people turning to God. It had to do with people's hearts being realigned with Creator God and that and their relationship with the Father being restored. Even now, that hasn't changed. Even now, that is not different. So, even though we talk, you know, in the, in the New Testament, you hear this word or this language about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not the same thing as being filled with the Holy Spirit, but they are very much connected. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is very much like this idea of being prepared for this filling of the Holy Spirit, right? So I've got something. I'm, I'll be back to, you know, 
talk amongst yourselves, or maybe not. <laughs> being filled with the Holy Spirit is in very many ways like being a water hose, <laughs> right? So oftentimes we think about being filled and it has to do with what's inside of us. And there isn't anything wrong with that. Like the moment we give our life to Christ, we have actually even before we give our life to Christ, we, there is the Holy Spirit is acting upon and in us. Right. That's that's a part of what it is to be a believer is to have a relationship with with Christ. Excuse me, have a relationship with the father through Christ that's empowered and we are changed by his Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is working through us in justification. The Holy Spirit is working in us and through us in sanctification, sanctification, making us more like Christ. But when it comes to this idea of being filled with the Spirit, it's about being empowered by God. It's about empowerment. And it's less about what's inside of us and more about what we allow to come out of us. See, I actually used this hose today because I was bringing my fish back into the office <laughs> um, and uh, I filled it with um, water. And there's actually still water in here. Um, and it's, it's got water and it's actually dripping on the stage right now. Candace is looking like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> but the idea that scripture paints, the picture that scripture paints about being filled with the Spirit is, is about what's coming out of us. And that has more to do with fruit than it does have to do with the gifts or this talents or this power that I have. I like to think about it like this. An apple tree, it, you, you know an apple tree is an apple tree. Certainly if you're an you know, individual who studies trees, then you would understand some of the nuanced differences between an apple tree and an orange tree or an apple tree and a pear tree. But a part of how the rest of the world knows it's an apple tree <laughs> is because apples grow on it. But something else grows on it too, and that's flowers. So many of you know most fruit-bearing trees have flowers that grow on them too. And the flowers that grow on those trees would never be considered the fruit. Though the flowers are important, I think I, I, like, to, I like to say that the flowers, when we start talking about this idea of being filled with the Spirit, the flowers are the display and they are, that, that's the display of power. And, that's even wor and that even works on behalf of the tree itself. But the idea of what it is to truly be filled is to bear fruit. That's how they, you think about when you think about the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Um, a, the larger portion of Scripture that we're going to talk about is in 1 Corinthians. Um, and um, the reason why we're talking about that is because oftentimes when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, many of us immediately, especially if we come from a Pentecostal background uh, or a charismatic background, we immediately start to think about speaking in tongues. I'm going to pause. Come on, so sorry. We come, some of us can come down real quick. <laughs> because, there, because the challenge that is before the church and has been before the church for a long time is around this idea of, well, how you know you got it? <laughs> how you know you feel? <laughs> and that's honestly what I was talking about with the fruit. But there is a portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians that really does a great job of clearing this up. So before we get into that portion, I think it's okay for us to know that there is tension around that. Um, so some of you know, I, I mean, and some of you don't, but in terms of praying in tongues, that's something that I do, like, and not, it's not something that I hide, but it's also not something I broadcast, because that's not really what the point is of praying in tongues. That's not really what the point is of being able to speak in tongues, because that isn't how this works. But one of the things that I remember growing up in church is that I was taught that speaking in tongues was the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, I, and, and in no way if, do I say this next thing as a, to dishonor those who have taught me. 
right? I've, I am so grateful for the rich heritage and theological development that I have. But I think it's also okay for us to understand that the church hasn't always gotten everything right. And it's okay for us to know that, that this idea of the evidence of the spirit is not rooted in the flower of being able to speak in tongues. That isn't the fruit. That isn't what points to the fact that you are filled with the spirit. That is a display of the filling of the spirit. So here's it. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. Here's a long portion of scripture that we're going to be in. First Corinthians um, uh, and we'll be in chapter 14 uh, verses one through 18. I'm going to read it all. It's, uh, this is Paul speaking and he's really talking to some folks who have some discrepancy and some disagreement about um, praying in tongues. He says, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Boom. Pause. That's an important thing. Underline it. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking in the power of the spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. But one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. That's why I was talking about before, like that idea of the flower also benefiting the, the tree itself, right? So when, when a tree flowers so that other, uh, so, so bees and birds will pollinate, and that helps to also to, to make room for fruit to actually be born on the tree. But it itself isn't the fruit. We'll keep on going. I wish you could all speak in tongues. That's what Paul says. I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you could all prophesy. <laughs> for prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly and no one will recognize or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler bugler <laughs> doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It's the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking into empty space. There are many different languages in the world and every language has meaning. But if you don't understand the language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it. But excuse me, and the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you, since you are so eager to have the special gifts and abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. So anyone who speaks in tongues should also pray for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but, uh, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit and I will also sing in words I understand. For if I praise God only in the spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people you, who hear you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, Paul saying that. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. That's a whole lot. <laughs> That's a whole lot. But here's one of the things I want us to like, I want this portion of scripture, as long as it is, I want it to, to settle some of the debate inside of us. Those of us who speaking in tongues is a part of our relationship and worship and prayer with God. We need to see that it's justified in scripture right here, period, point blank. It's in black and white in your Bible. For those of you who are like speaking in tongues is not a thing. Scripture doesn't allow for it. He's not talking about speaking different languages as it happened in Acts. When the spirit, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, they started speaking different languages so that the people that were around them that had gathered 
could understand what the, the gospel that Peter was preaching, right? They all heard them preaching and, and praising God in their own language. That's not even what Paul is talking about. Paul is literally talking about an unknown language. Nobody's going to understand. It is valid. And so some of us who walk around with the insecurity of not knowing, uh, is this a church where I can speak in tongues? The Bible says you can. <laughs> can I do this whenever I need to? The Bible says you can, right? I, that, so let us not have that. But the, the, also the age-old divide with regard to the evidence of the filling of the Spirit should also be squashed. Because it's also right here in Scripture that this isn't about division at all. That's why Paul starts from the beginning, let love be important enough for us to read through this and understand this is about what's called koinonia. Koinonia, it, it, it translates to a lot of different phrases, but it's not, it, so fellowship is one of them. Fellowship is what koinonia means, but it's not like hanging out with Christians playing cards. Right. That's I mean, that's just chilling. That's kicking it with your homies. Right. Like I'm not saying fe fellowship in that way. Koinonia is like daisy chaining all of a, a bunch of hoses. It's the idea that when we get together and we then we have an ability to the, in that fellowship, we have an ability to be more powerful. As we are acting through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's really what koinonia means. It's this, not that, oh, I speak in tongues, so then that means I've got a more important gift. No. And even though Paul is saying that he would rather you prophesy, it's not because prophecy is even the most important spiritual gift. That's not what he's saying. He's simply talking about the fact that those of you who are over here making yourself first-class citizens because you speak in tongues, humble yourself. Because don't nobody understand what you're saying, but God. <laughs> That's all he's saying. But he's also pointing to what has always been the foundation of what it is to be filled with the Spirit. It is to speak or act powerfully on behalf of God. And that's also why I say the fruit part is the evidence. You know you're filled with the Spirit of God when someone's life is transformed because you said something. That's how you know. That's how you know that when, when people around you, when your community, when your family is transformed by you acting or speaking on behalf of God, that's, how, that's the evidence. It's the fruit that is the evidence, not the acts themselves. And yes, they're powerful. But if Elijah called down fire from heaven and nobody cared, There is no evidence of him being filled with the Spirit. Lots of people in the Old Testament and the New Testament did miraculous things, and nobody was torn, turned to God because of it. The whole point of being filled with the Spirit of God is so that we can be his representatives in the earth. And so whether that means I'm speaking in tongues or whether that means that I am uh, preaching or whether that means I'm an administrator or whether that means I'm leading, whether that means I'm teaching children, doesn't matter. As long as the world is transformed by my activities on behalf of God, that is where the evidence comes in. And it requires surrender for us to be in that space. It requires surrender. I can't be coming on and off the spigot if I'm saying that I'm a hose and expecting to still be powerful. Yes, I may still have water inside me, but that's not the evidence of the spirit. It's water coming out. That's it's water coming out and being able to to water what I'm actually intending to be watered. That is what it is to be filled by the spirit, not just having the spirit in you. It's what's coming out of you that matters. So how is one filled with the Holy Spirit? Right. Because I already said that, like the moment we give our life to Christ, the spirit is already working in and through us. You're right. I get that. But this idea of being filled is something different in that. Is something coming out of me? Jesus actually speaks to that. In Luke chapter 11, he says, your fathers, uh, it's like 11 verses 11 through 13. I don't have the screen anymore. To do. <laughs> um, your fathers, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. 
So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will that your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask him. It, right. I know we it's it's deep for us because we start looking at like that. We start looking at the powerful display. We start looking at the beautiful flower and we think that it requires a lot of activity. And we think that it requires a whole lot of good. I mean, we got to do this. I got to be perfect. I got to go to church every Sunday. I got to do this. I got to be in Bible study. I got to read the Bible in a year because I got to have that Bible app. Uh, you feel we feel like that's And all of those are great things. All of those are important things in our spiritual development. And in many ways, those are flowers, just like speaking in tongues is a flower. And they edify us. But that isn't how this works. Being filled with the spirit, Jesus says very simply. That the father loves us that much that he would give us this gift simply by asking. I remember um, I remember being a part of a charismatic tradition and we had Terry services. All right. And so some of some of us remember what Terry services are. Like, like you get a bunch of teenagers in a room and y'all clap and say Jesus as long as you can until you start praying in tongues. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I I don't I think that's still a tradition. Right. And so I don't. I don't laugh at that as it being something that's insignificant. I laugh because of, uh, because that is such a that's such a common way of thinking that we have to do something. And that's never been a way in which God has ever worked with humanity. He hasn't worked with us that we have to do something. So, when we're in a Terry service and we're saying Jesus and we're clapping, believing that my sincere request of the Holy Spirit is what will allow the Lord, is, is, what, is what motivates God to fill me with the Spirit, my heart is exactly where it should be. When I'm in a Terry service believing that I say Jesus 150,000 times and that's what does it, my heart's not in the right place. That's the difference. It's all about our hearts. It's always been about our hearts. That's why Jesus, that's why both the Old and the New Testament uh, uh, attested this idea that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God cares about our actions, but he cares way more about our heart. So it's not about the method. You can sit silently in your bedroom and say, Lord, fill me with your spirit and done. <laughs> or you can be in a church service with 100 people and everybody saying Jesus over and over again. And as long as your heart is sincerely seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, done. It's not about the method. It's about the who, not about the how. Always about the who. And this is something that God wants for all people. That's why he said, I'm pouring out my spirit on all people, men and women, young and old, slave and free. That slave and free doesn't mean people who, who work for free. It has to do with socioeconomic difference, basically rich folk and poor folk. He wants to pour out his spirit on all of us so that we can powerfully speak and act on his behalf and so that the world around us has something that they get to walk away they get to walk away with after being in his presence they get to walk away with an apple and eat off of the powerful words and actions of God moving in and through us that is where the evidence is fam Jesus um did something in John chapter 20, verses, uh, verse 22. Um, and it was right before he was uh, ascending and uh, going back to heaven, going back to the Father. He gathered the disciples um, and he breathed on them. And right after breathing on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he breathed on them. And so some of us need to just like get into a room by ourselves, get our Bibles to John chapter 20 and just read verse 22. Right. Like I, the whole Bible is good. But what's the idea of asking God? Like the question that that was the motivation for this sermon is, can I can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? The answer is absolutely yes. 
We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be filled with his spirit. God has provided this gift for us in his Holy Spirit for us to act powerfully on his behalf. But I have to surrender myself to his will and sincerely seek him and allow him to breathe on me. Not unlike what happened with Jesus and the disciples. And for some of us, that may mean that we speak in tongues. That is an awesome, wonderful thing that we, you pray in tongues. Some of us are like, I don't even know what that's going to feel like. What is, ah! <laughs> that is not the tradition I grew up in. I've never really even heard it for real. And it all just feels like mumbo jumbo. It's not. <laughs> it's not. But I also do want, but here's one of the things that often happens. If that is, if that is the way we come into this, we're not fully surrendered. Right. Not everybody's going to speak in tongues when we ha when we're filled by the spirit. But some of us don't even know that that's a part of who we are. But we're afraid of what might happen on the other side of asking God to fill us. I'm afraid of what will happen to me because I don't want to be that weirdo. <laughs> and I'm saying that if we sincerely seek him, whatever's on the other side, he will be there. Whatever's on the other side, whether that is that awkward feeling of I don't know or, or it's something beautiful, it doesn't matter. He's on the other side, too. And he's not, he's not even not on the other side saying, come over here. He's like, let's go over there. <laughs> he's already, he's with us. If he never leaves us, never forsakes us, then even in us maturing and asking for his spirit, he's with us. He didn't ascend and then spit down on earth and say, receive the Holy Spirit. He gathered the disciples together, intimately breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit, right? So, yes, we can, but I feel like one of the things that we also have to ask ourselves is not just can we, it is do we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And the only thing that I can at this point is encourage the world around us needs us to be salt and light now. Not more than ever, but definitely now. <laughs> the world around us needs us to be salt and light. We need to be, as the church, bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Not fake fruit, not wax fruit, not plastic. Real fruit for our neighbors who are desperate for hope. We need to be bearing fruit, which we will not bear the fruit that the Father require, the needs for us to bear if we're not sincerely seeking him and acting for, out of the Holy Spirit, the power that comes for us to supernaturally act on behalf of God. So, for those of us longing and asking, what can I do about racism? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> For those of us longing and asking God, what can I do about COVID-19? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. For those of us asking, how is it that I can manage being going through the whole summer with all of my children at home and no summer camp, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to be filled <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and take an opportunity to ask God to fill you. Yes, we can be. And yes, he wants to fill us. Will you ask? So here, there and everywhere, let's pray. Father, you want to give us good gifts. And one of the gifts that you want to give us is the power and your essence, who you are. You want to breathe in us like Adam, and like Christ with his disciples. You want us to seek you. Not because you are, it's an ego trip, but because it requires a whole level of surrender and humility for us to be filled and used for your glory. And so you don't just make us filled with your spirit. 
we have an investment in it. And so, Lord, the parts of me that I have held tightly and have kept me from actually asking and truly seeking to be filled with your spirit, I release. I release them, whether it be fear or God, simply just unbelief. I release it now. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to fill me. Lord, breathe on me. Lord, breathe on your church. We need your spirit. We need your power. We need your words. We need your actions. We need signs and wonders so that the people around us who don't know who you are will be turned to you, God. They will be saved. Lives transformed, people healed, sicknesses cast out, <laughs> people restored. Because of the power of your spirit moving in and through your church, breathe on us, God. We submit ourselves. We surrender to you. Lord, where we have perhaps learned incorrectly, teach us and refresh us, God. Refresh us, God. Renew our mind and our thinking. May we long for the fruit while enjoying the flowers. Give us grace to long for the fruit while enjoying the flowers. We surrender. We trust you. Fill us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yo, fam, I'm glad that we get to be together. Um, uh, we are still going to be a couple of weeks before we get into phase three, where everybody is kind of together, right, together, <laughs> um, social distancing together. Um, so we've got uh, this week, uh, remind me, next week, is next week phase two? Anybody remember? It's okay. We'll make sure we let you know. Um, uh, and, and ultimately, phase two um, is what you see here, along with um, uh, some other like hospitality um, and um, safety teams and that kind of stuff as we prepare for phase three, where we're going to use as much of the sanctuary as possible and throughout, and also some rooms throughout the building. So we'll make sure that everybody knows what to expect then. Um, also. You still can uh, submit some ideas for sermons, right? You can do that now. You can do it on Facebook. Again, you can shoot a text or an email, um, and we'll throw those in the mix. Love you all. God bless and peace. <laughs>